Welcome to Keep IT Healthy Podcast, a show hosted by people making things happen in technology, aiming to optimize healthcare delivery, health, well-being, and fitness. My name is Jan Kaminski, and I'm the co-founder of AppLover, a company dedicated to improving the quality of life with IT solutions and digital advisory. We started making this podcast to amplify great thinking to propel healthcare forward. Our guest today is Gear Fisher, co-founder of OnForm and, any, and many others. Uh, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's great to, to join you today. Yeah, and um, could you tell us the backstory uh, about what brought, brought you to this career path in general? Sure. I mean, uh, it goes back a long way because i am uh, been around a long time. But um, I think <laughs> the main story is I, I graduated from Colorado State University with a civil engineering degree. I okay. uh, went to work for a, a civil engineering firm that was very computer oriented. Uh, I knew nothing about computers, but I started to learn on the job. Uh, and this is the early nineties. Okay. And I started, I, I was very fortunate as the internet was really starting to become popular. This is like 93, 94. Wow. I started just um, teaching myself to do programming. And oh, I, you, were, you were in the web consultancy company back then, right? No, this is while I was still a civil engineer at a, at a water oh, okay. resources engineering firm. And uh, I, I just was fascinated by computers. And I spent more time learning computers than civil engineering. And I switched career paths in like uh, late 96, uh, 97. And that's when I went to uh, work for a consulting firm that did basically HTML programming and built websites, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and that was fantastic. I learned a ton more about, uh, the internet, et cetera, you know, again, late nineties. And then it was, uh, 1999 when a very good friend of mine, uh, who I knew in college, Dirk Friel, uh, I was a cyclist and he was a cyclist and Dirk asked me to build a, basically a website that would communicate with athletes uh, instead of instead of having to fax in a training program and communicate with a coach. He, right. you know, he saw the the future of building a web page where a, a, an athlete could type in what they did, and the coach would get that and then make recommendations for training. And that was literally the start of Training Peaks uh, in 1999, and we started from there and um, built. Training Peaks organically for many years, which uh, eventually led to me selling my my shares there and started on form uh, in 2019. So that okay. was kind of the 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 25 30 year backstory. We, we'll get to Training Peaks for sure, but maybe we can talk more about your recent pro I mean more recent projects. So could you share some insights about uh, uh, about the inception of on form? Uh, and what prompted you to develop a video analyst and coaching platform? Because I know you're from this area, from this business, but what was the... Yeah, like? yeah and in about 2013, as Training Peaks was really growing, uh, and th for, for anybody that's listening, Training Peaks is a, a software platform that coaches and athletes use to communicate and to prescribe training, you know, uh, in the endurance world. So triathlon, cycling, running, um, and I realized that while training piece is very much about developing an athlete's fitness. There was also a component of technique or form. And I wanted to add video into training peaks, uh, especially like in swimming and running gait analysis. Uh, there's a lot of technique into, you know, exactly how you, yeah. you know, do really yeah, efficient yeah. swimming. Um, so I started looking around, again, this is like 2012, 2013 for uh, products that we could integrate that were doing video. And, you know, obviously apps were growing a ton then. And I, I reached out to a guy at the time, there was an app called Ubersense, which was a leader in the video, you know, coaching video capture uh, world. And that was Krishna Ramachandran. And my hope was to invest in that and then allow those videos to get integrated into Training Peaks, or maybe we could acquire it and bring that company in the fold or something. 
Um, and we had great discussions, but they en- eventually sold to Huddle, uh, a very large yeah. uh, U.S.-based video firm that that was kind of more well known for uh, you know recording a, a whole a whole talk a, a whole match or an entire game and breaking down plays. So that deal didn't work out, but I remained very interested in what video could provide because it's it's an incredibly good teacher when used well. So um i happened to see krishna you know tweet in late 2018 that he was leaving huddle uh after four and a half or so years working there and i was like you know what this is my moment to uh build a tool in video i i just remained really intrigued by it and reached out to krishna and that was the start of it uh we got together and started talking about what we could do in 2019 and just the state of things at that point, you know, there's plenty of other video analysis and coaching apps out there. Uh, but we, you know, had seen so much change in AI, you know, object detection, computer vision, cloud, yeah. uh, mobile, and we just thought we could build a better product. So we got to work in uh, 2019 and launched on form in March of 2020. Yeah, that, that was my uh my thought that was back in 2013 wasn't the, was the technology you know sufficient enough to to build a video analysis or it, it was actually better to wait a few more years when the, when all the things you mentioned kicked in in a sense and then became more <laughs> popular and more more developed yeah the video world in in 2013 basically there was ubersense and coach's eye um and the the big the big leap there was that you could control the video in slow motion like frame by frame analysis um but what they didn't have really figured out back then was really native cloud integration um and so the app was used to record video the videos were great uh ubersense grew a ton and coach's eye was huge but then as cloud came along, they had to bolt on cloud and it was a little kludgy and, you know, all these cloud services, AWS and Azure and, and Google Cloud Platform uh, really developed and grew. But the apps and managing video is hard. Videos are huge. And, and basically the right. advantage of being a latecomer was that we could we could add all that cloud stuff native. We could use AI. We could use you know, more modern techniques and it was vastly cheaper. Um, so that's what we did. And that was kind of one of the big differentiators when we launched. Okay. And what, so, um, and how does Onform differ right now from other coaching tools on the market? What's yeah, your well, number one, it's just the, the native integration of, of cloud, of, of AI tools for doing automatic capture of video and analysis tools. Um, but honestly, the biggest thing is that not only does it record video, but we built it or envisioned it as a platform, you know, truly a tool that a coach could use to communicate with their athletes, not just to record and analyze video. So we built a sharing mechanism that's basically like a private direct messaging system. And mm-hmm. that really set us apart from some other products out there. So in one tool, we kind of have a, a very easy to use video analysis tool for doing annotations and markup and side by sides, et cetera, as well as a platform for keeping all those videos organized. And it automatically syncs and works with the cloud. So you don't have to, you don't have to choose where to store anything. We, we organize all the management of the files for you. So I would say ease of use, you know, the native cloud integration and the ability to communicate, you know, inside the platform really set it apart. Okay. And you're working on this for the past four years, right? Yeah. Yeah. We started in 2019, launched in 2020, right, right at the, right right at the it was going crazy. Yeah. But that um, was, it, did it help? You know, a lot of people get into the sport, you know, in a sense. Yeah, you know, it honestly, it helped and hurt. Number one, it helped because, you know, as you do in software, the product that we launched with was only a fraction of what we envisioned, right? It was a very much a version 0.1. So 
with with so much people so many people looking for remote communication tools you know we definitely uh met a need but when you're brand new nobody knows about you so it was really hard to kind of get our name out there because people stop playing sports right uh schools sort of shut down team sports shut down and yeah. only a few sports like golf continued to do well and and individual it, was, it was a blessing and a curse yeah and individual sports right the endurance yeah. for example yeah but in, during your career um as i saw that you've grown several organizations significantly starting from training peaks but there was also this company called Peaksware, and I noticed that you grew this team from 20 to over 300 people. Uh, could you, you know, share the story of that? What was the, sure. um, what, was, what was the story behind Peaksware? Yeah. So with Training Peaks, it it really grew a lot uh, over the years. First, very slowly, but then you know, like 2009 to 2012, it really took off. And um, we brought in a single uh, sort of a super angel investor, if you will, in 2007, um, used that money to build the team and, and growth really took off, like I said, 2009, 2012. Well, that, uh, that guy, that investor, good friend of mine, um, he had also acquired a few other companies. Uh, the umbrella idea was to put together different companies that all focused on skill acquisition. And he actually owned a company in the music space that what Training Peaks did for endurance athletes, this company uh, called Make Music with a product known as Smart Music, um, actually did for music learning. It, it provided music teachers a software program to uh, basically provide assignments of musical learning to students, they would go home and practice it. And the computer would listen to them play and grade how they did it and then as an assignment. It's an amazing program. Uh, it's now called Make Music Cloud. So the vision there was we started Peaksware sort of as an umbrella. And I ended up running, we, we, we folded Training Peaks into that. We folded Make Music into that. He had also acquired another company called Alfred Music, which was a music publisher. Um, and then we also went out and acquired uh, a startup in the strength and conditioning world called Train Heroic, which has done very well over a few years. So we put those four companies together, uh, which I became the CEO of Peaksware and oversaw all four of those entities. And, okay. they, you know, they all kind of had a, the same strategic string, which was building platforms to allow people to learn a skill. So essentially it became like a holding training piece was part of it. And then you had a, a different entities that you also uh, run in a sense. Exactly. Was it yeah. It, it became peaks were holdings and um, it's kind of like a, a conglomerate, if you will. And I, you know, I moved from being CEO of Training Peaks to CEO of Peaksware, and how, how that was tough. You know, it was, it was uh, I certainly didn't have a background in music. Um, I ran that till the end of 2018 uh, as I was, um, you know, just learning. I call it getting an MBA on the fly. You know, uh, my investor, Andy Stevens, uh, who now is the CEO of Peaksware, He's taught me, you know, a massive amount. We, we, we made these acquisitions. Um, we had to do a lot of restructuring. We grew various teams, um, all with the idea of, you know, trying to use some best practices across the various businesses uh, to build these platforms, you know, to something bigger and more meaningful. So it was, a, it was an incredible time in, in my career and learned, you know, all kinds of dealt with all kinds of things and, and learned a lot through the process. I love to say, what were the key strategies that you implemented to drive the growth? Because, okay, so one you mentioned acquisitions, but you grew from like 20 to 300, which is yeah. in three or four years. So what was, what was the general strategy? Was it, we know the platform so we can use the same model in different areas, right? Or? So training peaks grew, you know, from like 2000, Oh, 2007, we were like 15 or 20 people. By 2012, we were about 80 people. Um, mm -hmm. And then at that point, we started, we, we created Peaksware. 
But, you know, the number one strategy is always really simple. Build an amazingly good product. You have to, have to, have to build a great product. Um, acquisition is handy when, you know, you, you can deploy capital to accelerate growth by not having to go through the painful growth curve of, you know, growing a business. You can find one that's already doing something or has some traction and then hopefully through some good management practice, et cetera, uh, you get a benefit of bringing in those acquisitions acquisitions, and seeing them grow. Doesn't always work out that way. I've had, you know, yeah. we made several that, that didn't work out so well. Um, if you're a founder that got some capital from, let's say, PE or VC and looking to acquire, so what, yes. should, he, what, what, what should be, be his biggest fear? Uh, I would say the biggest fear is not external, but rather internal. Just because I, let's say the CEO of the company, am excited and see the vision of how this acquisition could help the, the business. You have to have your employees and staff share that same feeling internally. Because okay. once you bring that business in, Right. The expectation from the, the company that you acquire is, oh, man, we're going to be part of this big organization. They've got money. They've got resources. They've got people and we'll really be able to grow and it's going to be amazing. That's that's what the, the acquired company thinks internally. What people think is, oh, my God, more work. What, now I have to deal with these guys. What are they even going to do? They're going to come in and think they have to tell me, oh, why do I have to now figure out how to do a marketing plan for them? And so I, I minimize the, uh, I, I guess, the, the preparation necessary and the alignment needed from my internal staff, to, which is required to bring this thing in and then grow it. Right. It was like, guys, why don't you see how amazing this could be? Well, we have a thousand other things that you've told us to do. Now we have to lump this one in. And, and that was, you know, again, I, I put, put the, the blame on myself for not getting enough internal alignment on the vision and carving right. off enough time and energy to really, you know, bring these things in and grow them. You started training peaks, but not as a, as a CEO, you were actually uh, coding the platform yourself and you were a CTO, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, I started out programming, did all the programming for five years at Training Peaks. And I was not a really professional programmer. I taught myself. Uh, I went back to school to get a computer science degree, but, you know, it seemed pointless. Academia is so different than yeah. the real world. So I, I dropped out of, of that. And uh, by 2005 or so, I had coded myself into such a ball of spaghetti that I needed <laughs> somebody, a uh, professional to come in and help. So, um, yeah, I was definitely the de facto CTO and, you know, co-founder there. I, I, I ended up being really the product guy, uh, myself yeah. and Dirk, you know, we were constantly thinking about what the product should do. I didn't even think of myself as a product manager or owner, if you will. I hadn't even heard the term until probably 2010, but um, by and large started really more in the technical world. Uh, and in 2010, I took over the, the, the CEO role. Uh, we had brought in another guy early on a few years into the company and he acted as our CEO and, and he had a great, you know, larger vision for things. Um, I learned a lot from him, but, uh, he left in 2010. I took over the CEO role and, and went on from there. Um, what were the biggest challenges back then? You know, when you were well, next time for te technology. Yeah. Technology from the standpoint of what to do every day is real easy. You write more features, you make a code more efficient, you refactor, you, it, it's all comes down to you know, writing code and making the product better. As CEO, you're no longer writing code. You're making the company better. You're focused on people. You're figuring out what teams to grow. You obviously have to think about marketing, sales, customer support, uh, how to hire, how to fire, you know, like a million other things besides just writing code day in and day out. And I, 
honestly, for the first year of my transition there, uh, after I hired a couple of professional developers, I, I asked myself, what good am I to this company? I, I used to write code all day. Now what do I do? And it was actually a difficult transition for a while. But then it opened my eyes, you know, stepping back from being in the code to see the other things that are necessary strategically. Um, you, you know, it was a big transition for me, but something that I'm sure many founders go through um, going from, you know, the hands on part to to figuring out how to really grow the company to man managing people. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, OK. And uh, with, you know, you, you moved. So, of course, you grew the company. But what interests me the most is that you grew the company, the training peaks, then you moved to slightly, let's say, bigger entity that rather you didn't manage people in, in, in like one company, you managed companies in a sense. And then you moved to creating on form, right? That we discussed at the beginning. And that was some starting from the scratch. And this is for, from my perspective that really interesting like what were the lessons that you've learned actually starting from the scratch like all over uh from the beginning um with such attraction before like did it help did you were you tired like, what, what, what was the story yeah no that's a great question because you know when i left we had a little over 300 employees across all the all the organizations um and then giving that up and going back to zero was honestly quite uh, scary. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's really something to get something off the ground from zero. Um, and so I had a lot of question in my own mind. Can I do this again? Um, is it even possible? Gosh, so everything, you know, I, I hadn't dealt with such nitty gritty stuff you know, opening a bank account. How do I go about dealing with that? You know, I mean, I, I had been so far removed from some of the day to day stuff. Yeah, that, 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 um, that was my, yeah, yeah, that, that was my, that, that, that I wanted to mention that. So basically, you, you went so high in the same management structure that then you needed to come back and, you know, <laughs> buy desks to the office or something, probably. So, so like, what was the, what was the feeling back then? Yeah, it was, it was, it's scary, you know, being, starting a company, I tell people is, it's thrilling, it's terrifying, it's, it's fun, it's tortuous, uh, it's rewarding, it's draining, it's like every emotion up and down, depending on the, the day, right? You're like, you see somebody actually buy your product and you're elated, uh, then you go for two weeks and nobody's bought anything and you're basically like, well, I guess this isn't going to work. I mean, it's, it's, it's really quite brutal process. Yeah. Um, but the overarching thing for me is because I had gone through the growth of training peaks and, and peaks where um, there's certain things you just kind of end up dealing with that, you know, I was more calm. Uh, I used to literally sweat every day. Are people still going to buy our product? What's, what if they all quit? What if they go to a competitor? What if we can't deliver this feature? What if our marketing is terrible? What if, and now I'm a little bit more like, okay, look, you know, it's in, instead of the super highs and lows, I think through experience, it's, it's a little bit more of a, a calm wave. I still experience all those emotions. Um, but you take a lot of those lessons, you know, everything from like, how valuable the product is, but also how valuable it is to have, you know, a team around you. And it takes a while to build that team and key people are unbelievably critical. Um, but it's, I, I, so much of it comes back to basics, right? Respond to customer support emails, help people when they need it, try and put yourself out there and make yourself accessible, make sure the product works. And it's something you're proud of that you would use yourself. Like, so many of those sort of basic things are are the drivers you know for me every single day okay and you know you mentioned the product a few times and i read this in one of the interviews and on your blog as well uh that you are uh you were describing this concept of minimum delightful product versus <laughs> mvp so of course minimum viable product so how has this mindset impacted your product development and what does it mean in general, the MDP, right? The minimum yeah. life. 
Well, you hear MVP uh, all the time, right? Venture capitalists will say, oh, build your MVP or, or the engineering team will be working towards MVP. And it's just something I create. I, for me, I developed a disdain for it because minimum viable product is what an engineering team is striving for. Does it meet the requirements? Does it calculate the number correctly? Does it not crash? Like those are the things that, you know, suffice to say an engineering team are really focused on day in and day out. Mm -hmm. Minimum delightful product is a leap towards what your customer cares about, right? Like it has to be good enough that your customer will be delighted by whatever you're developing. It doesn't have to solve the world's problems, but it needs yeah. to solve whatever you're designing it for in such a way that it's at least delightful to the customer. So I use MDP to remind our teams that what actually matters is the customer viewpoint, not the engineering yeah. viewpoint, not the internal viewpoint, not what we think is cool, but what the customer thinks is cool. Now, granted, like I said, it doesn't have to be the version 29 of it, but it needs to be beyond viable. I just hate the word vi viable means, you know, it's sufficient. I've, I, I don't like sufficient. I want something beyond a little bit beyond sufficient. Uh, and also it leads to better customer feedback. If you put something out that's viable, a customer might be like, yeah, it's all right. But if you get it, you know, 25% further to where it's delightful, they might really give you, you know, much, much better uh, feedback so you can actually build a product better and faster. So in general, you would say focus on the client and marketing, not the product while launching the, while launching it. No, not quite. I'm saying make sure the product, and I'm very much a product based person, make yeah. sure the product at least gets to the, the delightful stage on the core, you know, use case mm -hmm. rather than it only being viable because if you're only at viable you're just not going to get the impact that you're looking for from the customer so mm -hmm. the product is critical that it actually does something to the point of delight rather than to the point of viability okay okay and i also read something else on your blog you you were expressing this a few times actually so that changing one's beliefs is harder than changing one's behavior. And that probably uh, was, I mean, it happened a few times in, in, in your career. So could you explain what do you mean by that? Especially, and how, how did, how it influenced your approach to product development and business? Sure. Um, it's just something, you know, in some ways it's very obvious. Um, the most important thing that people you know, who they truly are is what they believe, right? They believe, you know, what they want a lot of times. Um, and you really can't change people's beliefs at the core. And I, and I mean this from the standpoint of values. I mean this from the standpoint of customer interaction. I mean it, you know, from the standpoint of what the type of employees you want to bring on, even to the type of customers you're going after. But you can, you know, people can change their behavior and they can learn different workflows. Um, but I gave up trying to get people to believe something that I want to believe. I might believe a certain way and I just find it futile to try and convince other people to believe the same thing that I believe. I, you can believe and be in, influenced or, in, you know, understand how, whatever you want. I don't care what I care about is, can I get your behavior to change? Mm -hmm. um, and that's all I think we can really go for. So changing somebody's behavior, like I said, whether it's from the product standpoint or whether it's from an employee customer value or, or uh, internal values of, of the type of people you hire, just be aware that it's impossible to change their beliefs and the, the behaviors can change. So, so try and work towards that goal. Um, I know that the, the biggest traction right now is with golfers, weightlifters, and baseball coaches right now. Am I correct? Yes, that's correct. And so what are the reasons for that? 
was it like a sales strategy that you had or was um, it coincidence? No, you know, getting people to use your product is kind of a combination of how bad do they need it? How good does the product, you know, solve? What's their, what's their sort of uh, ability to pay for it? Um, I started out on form thinking that we might take it in one certain direction. Um, equestrian, my daughter was a, a, an equestrian and I saw how the, how she was being coached and uh, I thought we could build a tool that would really help, you know, equestrian trainers, but it turns out they just didn't have an interest They're They're, they just, you know, weren't inclined to use technology, et cetera. But as we were launching the, the, tr the coaches, you know, from golf, we were getting organic traction. We were getting organic traction in track and field, particularly from throws coaches, jumps coaches, and we we're getting coaches in baseball using video. And that just happens to be, you know, currently where the natural benefit aligns with the ease of use and everything else. Um, those coaches see the benefit of video. They had a natural inclination towards using video. And so that's where we, you know, sort of migrated to, or I wouldn't say migrated to, that's just what we put our attention toward. Now mm -hmm. we get coaches in every possible sport you can think of from fly fishing to, uh, dog trainers to, um, you know, polo to, to literally every sport, yeah. uh, basketball, soccer, you know, football, you name it. But from a business standpoint, we don't have time to, or, or the resources, I should say, to proactively go after all of those, you know, you have to decide where your highest ROI is going to be. And, and so for us, it's, it's focusing on those, those sports that had organic traction, which is, you know, really golf, baseball, and track and field for now. Yeah. And uh, with one particular sport, you had some problems, uh, as I remember, because you mentioned that introducing on form to the horse training world yeah. uh, was met with uh, resistance. So yeah. what was it all about and how did you navigate this challenge? Yeah. Well, my whole idea was, as we were coming up with on form and, and just starting to build it, because my daughter was an equestrian and I had seen how coaches interact with her and I, we would go to these competitions and every parent would hold up their, their iPhone and video their, their kids, you know, doing these competitions. And I would see it in training where kids would hold up video and record themselves. And then they would look at it. And I was like, ah, if only we had a better platform for doing video, Surely these trainers would love to use it and it would stay organized and they could look back on the video and see how the, they're progressing. And so that was kind of my, I had done a fair amount of, of customer research there. And um, when we finally got the product out and I went to my trainer, my daughter's trainer to look at it, they're like, Hey, that's cool. You know, um, neat, but yeah, I don't, yeah, I, you know, I just really have to feel how the horse feels and mm -hmm. you, that's probably, yeah, that's, I don't, I don't think I can really use video. Mm -hmm. And I realized like, gosh, you know, maybe this person just didn't understand what I was doing. So I went to another trainer uh, at a big competition and asked them and I got the same exact feedback, which was like, uh, you know, I mean, the kids like to video themselves, but I have to see it with my own eyes and, only I can tell how the horse is feeling that day, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a lot of truth to that. It, it, and I was like, but the video would be so helpful, right? You could do it and analyze it in slow motion and side by side. And basically it was just lost on them. They're, they're, they were um, just disinterested in using the technology um, or, you know, having to do more work, right? Like they're already very busy, back-to-back -back lessons. They saw it as doing more work rather than a tool to improve their their athletes if you will so after hearing that you know a bunch of times we put the product out there we partnered with an entity that would take it into the equestrian world but it just fell on deaf ears and you know holding up their phone was good enough and the kids would look at it every once in a while it turned out to be good enough and we certainly didn't have the resources to do the education campaign uh to convince people no 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 no, no. i know you don't really need it but 
gosh, you got to need it. They just, there wasn't an inherent need, a strong enough inherent need. Um, and so I was like, all right, fine. We're, we got to put our attention elsewhere. I would sure love to have them love it. But again, I can't change their behavior. I tried to change their workflow. I, I mean, I can't change what they believe. They believe they didn't need it. I tried to change their behavior, but it was just too difficult. So we pivoted, you know, or I wouldn't even say pivoted. I just stopped paying attention to the equestrian world. Uh, we still have some trainers using the app, certainly. Um, but it's just not a focus for us proactively to go after the equestrian world. Okay. And uh, I want to come back to this to this product story. I know you're, you have your own philosophy about products and, and how to build them and how to make them great. So um, I want to ask a few questions uh, on that topic. And you emphasize the importance of, in general, um, of feature development that creates real value for users, right? Rather than focusing on the popularity of the feature. So could you provide uh, yeah. examples of how you applied this approach to you know, your product management roles or management in general of products? Sure. I, and this is a part, this is like my favorite subject. Um, you know, a lot of time and hard knocks. My, my philosophy is essentially, no matter how much customer research you do and, you know, having product managers doing surveys and interviewing customers, and blah, blah, blah. The only truly valuable research is building a feature and putting it out there and, and seeing the feedback. And when you build that feature, the definition of success is very, very rarely how many people use it, how popular is the feature. And a perfect example of that is something like the backseat of your car. When you look at your car, the reality is 99% of the time, you never even use the back seat. Yeah, that's true. Almost never. Maybe a certain demographic, maybe parents of children, they might use a back seat every day. But I guarantee you that parent doesn't use four wheel drive every day, despite their vehicle being four wheel drive. But the reality is you probably wouldn't have bought your car without a back seat. You only use it 1% of the time, but you're not going to buy it without it. The difference is in the key. This is an incredibly key understanding for product teams, I believe. It's not in how often that backseat gets used. It's when you need it, it's incredibly useful, <laughs> right? When three of you are standing there and you want to go to lunch, it's either take three cars because none of you have a back seat, or you just pile into your car and you can go to lunch now. It's incredibly useful when you have it. Same with four wheel drive. 99% of the soccer moms in the USA never use four wheel drive on a day to day basis. But boy, that one time when you slide into a snowbank and you can back ride out and keep going, incredibly useful, right? You don't want, you buy a lot of times, you buy the product, you know, aspirationally, or it's comfortable knowing you've got it, right? Well, when I need four wheel drive, I've got it. When I need that back seat, when I need the trunk of my car, it sure is handy. But day in and day out, if you measured the use of a bunch of features in your car, you never use them, right? right? Heck, how often do you use your heater in the summer? Never. But by gosh, when it's 12 degrees outside, it sure comes in handy for a few months, right? So yeah. popularity is, in my view, a very poor predictor of whether a feature is good. Because I would always hear these things. We would have these endless debates like, well, that feature is only going to be used by, you know, 3% of the population. And I'm like, however, it's going to be used by a different 3% over the next six months. And they're going to get some kind of great value from it. So that sort of philosophy, I think, drives you know, whether a product is worth building. Um, there's a whole nother set of criteria really for what, what, what to build and how do you decide? And that's, um, that's also kind of a fun topic as well. Yeah, but, so how do you determine which features will truly engage users and drive product traction? Yeah. Number one, I would say is you have to have your own belief 
and your own roadmap strategy. And you have to align these features as you think of them, as your customers ask for them with a longer term roadmap strategy. Okay. On top of that, you also have to ask yourself these, go back to the basics. You know, if you can make a customer use case for it, Mm -hmm. it's probably a pretty good idea. I mean, gosh, I could see where people would really like to insert a row in a computed Excel column because they forgot to add something. So man, if only you could insert three rows and add some numbers in there rather than having to retype every single number in a column. Amazing, right? Like convince yourself that it's going to be useful. See if you can convince one or two other people in your company or, or, you know, that it could be useful and it has to ratchet up that chain of does this align to a strategic roadmap? And then mm-hmm. there, there is certainly the case of whether it applies broadly. Okay. And I, I, I want to be careful not to contradict what I just talked about. I believe building features that are broadly applicable are really, really important, right? So if I can build a feature that works for a baseball coach and a golf coach and a volleyball coach and a netball coach and a, a swimming coach, that's great. Now they may not use it every day, right? To the popularity point. But if at some point in time, a coach across all those different verticals might use a feature, then yes, it ratchets up in importance. So mm-hmm. broad applicability, alignment with roadmap, and convince yourself just on the basic tier, can you see value in this? Those things all have to play a, a part in the waiting game of you know, whether or not a feature should you know, make it to production. Mm-hmm. On the and- counter side of that, just to finish, Again, what I don't believe in is spending, well, let me put it this way. We would hire product managers that make as much of a salary as as a programmer, right? Mm -hmm. And these product managers and researchers would research the death out of a feature. And most of the time they would convince themselves that it wasn't needed. After they would do this research, the product would die because they couldn't convince themselves that 90% of people are going to love it. And... I had to go back to them and, and do two things. One, all you need is about 55 per co- 55% confidence that a feature would be used, right? That it, that it could create some delightful value. You just need to get it over the line of, you know, of confidence, uh, as well as the amount of time you do doing research versus having a developer actually build it and put it out there in the wild. It, it, the only true real feedback is building the thing and putting it out there. That's the only way you get valuable feedback. So Mm -hmm. I really tried to minimize the time we would do research and maximize the time we would just put a program on it. They make the same, it's the same, it's the same salary between these two people or a couple of people. So it's the same internal expense. One, you just get three months down the road of an investigation. And most of the time you decide you're going to kill it. The other one might take you two, three weeks to build the thing and put it out there. And you can just do that iterative cycle on real product feedback much Mm -hmm. faster if you just, you know, flat out build the thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So these are the primary criteria for prioritizing work. Uh, But what about the um, customer problem? So, of course, you mentioned product. So that's a, let's say, solution creator. So what strategies do you employ to identify and understand your customer? Uh, The best one is listening to their feedback and customer support. Okay. Um, That's without a doubt the easiest Uh, one. Um, See if you're getting uh, qualitative feedback like, hey, I love your product, but I wish it did this. Hey, I find your product really useful. Um, but it's not very good at this. It would be sure great if it could do that. Like, listen to the feedback that they're giving you. Um, Mm -hmm. Other things like, you know, are they paying for it? Are you seeing people, you know, actually pull out their wallet and pay for your product? That's that's a really easy gauge of whether it's working or not. Um, Mm -hmm. I think those are, you know, obviously, I like I said, I did a bunch of research and that research all proved wrong. I convinced myself with the research I did that this equestrian market would be great. 
then we put the product out there and nobody bought it. And I, it doesn't matter how much research you do or how much you do to convince yourself. It's very clear that they didn't want to pay for it. So um, that's just the best feedback I think you can get. And, you know, make your engineers answer some customer support emails. You'll get a real good idea uh, real quick of, of what's important. That's a, that's a, that's a nice idea, actually. <laughs> but, but did you actually do it? Did you do it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. If, you're, if your engineers are not, maybe they're not typing the actual response, but they right. better be sitting with your customer support team and feeling the pain of your customer. If they don't have customer empathy, you'll get nowhere. If your engineering team doesn't use your product and use your product to solve the problem it was designed for, Find some other engineers that do like it's so it's right there. It's it can be you. It's 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 software is such an accessible thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can have it. Your entire team should be trying it and using it. You don't have to use it every, you know, maybe not every single minute of the day. They don't have to. In Training Peaks case, we didn't only hire Ironman triathletes to be programmers. But I'll yeah. tell you what, the people who actually use the product versus those that didn't were miles ahead in terms of the customer value, understanding, understanding what our value proposition was even as a company. Like if you're not using the product that you're working on, you might as well be writing printer drivers for a, I don't know, for a, for a printer and some, just something that's really not customer facing. So yeah, uh, that's the best. Okay. And uh, you know, you, you mentioned a lot of problems in product uh, management, but could you share a specific example of, of a challenging problem that you encountered encountered while leading your organizations and how you approached solving it, solving it. Well, there's, there's a lot of those. Um, I mean, I think in a, a specific one is when do you decide to kill a feature? You know, when do you decide to, uh, turn something off and man, it's painful. I, at Training Peaks, we had this entire that we had worked for years on uh, a nutrition component where you could log your your food and meals, and you know you could balance out all your micro and macronutrients and all this stuff. Um, but the reality was, people didn't value it like we had hoped, and other products came along, especially in the app world, um, where they could do it just way way better and faster and easier. And number one, all of our team inside Training Peaks just wasn't all that excited to build the world's greatest nutrition tracking system. We were excited to build the world's greatest training and fitness management system. <laughs> and we had energy for that every day. But it became clear that we didn't have the energy to build this nutrition stuff. And if you're not going to put all your energy into something and make it great, that's a really darn good sign. You probably shouldn't even be bothering because you can't really ask people to pay for something that you don't even think you're going to put in the energy to. So it was tough, but after many years, we finally killed the product. Um, and it was actually a great relief, I think, to our team because, I mean, it was probably a quarter million lines of code. It was a huge component of training peaks from 2005 to 2010. Um, and yeah, when we shut it down, there were a lot of customers that were angry about it, but instead we built an integration to these other apps, uh, My Fitness Pal and Lose yeah. It, some other apps that were out there. And we just pulled in very basic information. And it was so much easier to support. Our internal teams didn't have to deal with all the bugs and you know all the dependencies that were created from this nutrition stuff. And it freed us to go do other things that we were excited about. So it's a constant not battle, but you have to constantly be aware of what are the things that I can delete um, in order to just clean up code, make your, you know, you might make a few customers angry, but hopefully you'll make more customers happy in the long term. You also, you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned the product uh, teams a few times, and I wanted to ask one additional thing here. Where do you, where usually, uh, or any, any advice on how to find a perfect product owner? Man, a tough one. Uh, if you have any suggestions, let me know. It's actually tough from, from my view. This is probably what people had the hardest time working with me um, because I was the product owner and founder. 
moving away from that role and getting other people to feel the same vision and to feel the same, uh, you know, training peaks was my baby for years. And so handing that over to other people, very difficult. I would say be uh, proactive about it, uh, especially as a founder, you're going to need to do more than just work on the product. Um, I was not proactive enough in, in terms of identifying key people, um, bringing them in and saying, hey, I want you to take this over in two years. Here's what's important to me. Here's, here's a framework I use for evaluating you know, features. Here's how I talk to customers. I was not proactive enough in that, but I would, I would suggest that people make it a point. Um, mm -hmm. Founders make it a point, other product owners that are, you know, growing or taking over other things, make it a point to proactively learn how these decisions get made. What are, what are the values inside your own company that are important that you want to make sure get transferred over to somebody taking over that product ownership role and make sure they understand the customer. Customer empathy for a product owner is the number one driving force that they have to have. They mm -hmm. absolutely have to feel the problem that the customer faces and the benefit and the, the, the solution that we provide, how it so incredibly well helps them you know, overcome that problem. Mm -hmm. And, and, uh, if you can be proactive about that, then, and it'll probably take, you know, easily a year or two to transfer, you know, how, how I would do something to somebody else. Then I think you'd be in a lot better shape, um, going forward. And I saw um, uh, that you're currently serving also as an executive technical advisor for college sport, uh, sports evaluation. Could you elaborate on the role? and your contributions to the organizations and the organization itself? Sure. So uh, CSE, College Sports Evaluation, is a, is a company that basically puts on events and analyzes uh, player performance in terms of identifying sort of the norms and standards that different positions in different sports are required to have in order to play their positions well. So what mm -hmm. they primarily do is they'll evaluate, let's say all of the players in a baseball on a baseball team. And then based on those stats, they sort of can rank from what's, what's a, how fast can a division one NCAA shortstop run from home plate to third versus a Juco player in a, in a junior college third baseman. Mm -hmm. And is there a, is, you know, all in the point of being able to, to help decide should your, your athlete in high school aim for a division one uh, school to try and get a scholarship or should they be really happy if a division three school is willing to give them a scholarship? You know, where does, where does, an, where does a person rate in terms of that potential in terms of getting a, a scholarship? And mm -hmm. so they've created a whole evaluation criteria and testing framework. My role uh, early on was to sort of set some of the technology guidelines. I, I identified and hired the, the CTO of the company. Uh, I helped, you know, shape some of the very initial technology choices that they made. Uh, but my role now is very much advisory. The CTO, he takes care of everything uh, nowadays. I'm a backseat sort of advisor to him um, and just help him sort of think through certain things and help, uh, help, you know, provide guidance where possible. So my role is definitely not a day to day at this point. Okay. Are you advising any other startups, by the way, or, or are you like active in this field or not really? I'm not. Um, I, I don't find it to be something I'm, uh, super passionate about i mean i'm really? um i certainly have have talked to a handful of folks you know like we're doing today um but i, I just don't gravitate towards the opportunity I, I don't find that i'm i'm you know trying to share my beliefs or get others to believe the same thing is is just not i guess in my my nature so um okay. 
but I do, you know, I, I enjoy sharing some of the things that I've learned along the way. And if people find that valuable, great. But um, mostly put my energy into building, you know, on form again here. Yeah. And do you sometimes miss the, um, the period when you mentioned you were rather managing other companies and entities uh, or you find the current, let's say, um, the, the current the current company and like starting from the scratch that thrilling that you would never uh, change the, the the you know ex- swap places in a sense. <laughs> I do miss the people. Yeah, I miss you know starting again from zero uh, is really really hard when you go from from having teams and people to manage uh, and interact with to doing it virtually, um, which on form is entirely virtual. We have a team, you know, a couple teams around the world. We have a team in the U S. Um, I miss, I miss working with some of the old folks that, uh, that I got to, to work with, of course, but now that we're finally gaining some really good traction, I'm starting to feel that again, you know, we're, we're 10 people now at on form. So still small, but growing, uh, 10 is a lot more than two. So we've we've grown a, a little bit. What's the future then? I mean, the I mean, I know no, no one can say, but how do you see the future of digital coaching? I mean, the future of coaches in general, and of course yeah. your role um, and uh, as on form in that. It's an exciting time. I mean, with Training Peaks, we did we basically brought technology and objective training metrics to coaches all over the world to help people with their fitness. And it was really fun as like watches, GPS watches and power meters and heart rate monitors grew. We added all that data into, into training peaks. And that same thing is happening now at on form. I see lots of ways uh, in golf and baseball, there's other devices measuring velocity, measuring, you know, launch monitors. Like I have right back here in my studio, Uh, for, you know, where the golf ball goes. So in general, bringing objective data into video is becoming easier and easier and more exciting because it's, it's telling the story of what's happening. Video tells an amazing story of body mechanics, right? So the ability to bring in more objective data, sort of like okay, here's what the body did and here's the outcome that it produced. The ball flew 300 feet. Um, I swam 50 meters in, you know, this amount of time, right? There's always an input and an output and video tells a lot about the input, right? What the body did, I threw, my arm moved like this and it resulted in a, in a curve ball at 82 miles an hour. Or my arm moved like this and it resulted in a curve ball at 87 miles an hour. If we can tell that story through objective data, through better video, um, and allow a coach to then leverage that information to communicate more clearly with, with their athletes, that's what's happening every day. And I see that becoming more and more instructive and easier and easier to get value out of that uh, so that that, you know, we're trying to reduce the, the time it takes for an athlete to develop those skills. And video is an amazing teacher, and we're we're focused on putting that power in the hands of coaches, uh, so that they can then communicate that to their athletes. And it's it's an exciting time because of so much so much cool stuff happening in AI uh, and machine learning, uh, video. You know what computers can do, and some of the stuff that we're rolling out in the next few months is mind boggling compared to what was possible three years ago, even. Mm -hmm. So it's a fun time to be part of it. And I, and I see all of that developing to help coaches, you know, use video even more effectively. So so would you say there is no modern coaching for any sport without technology uh, on this, let's say level? Yeah. I mean, the reality is coaches, I mean, I saw a transition in professional cycling that coaches used to shun technology. It's like, look, we always rode five hours on Thursdays. So now you're going to ride five and a half hours. So go do it. I'm a coach. I know I've been around this sport for 30 years. Yeah. (laughs) We brought technology and, and more objective assessment into that and said, Hey, you know what? Maybe you don't need to ride five and a half hours tomorrow because you rode five hours today. Why don't you ride two hours tomorrow? And we're going to, we're going to see some, some changes to your fitness. 
So we did that through some techniques that I'm excited to bring also to these other sports with on form, but yeah, you can't be an effective coach by feeling it anymore, just because you see it and you have that eye and you're, that's going to be part of the equation. I'm not discounting it. I'm saying your feel for the game, your feel for what an explosive player is, et cetera, et cetera, is good. But there is, uh, there's going to be an ever more influential component of technology in coaching because it is ever more helpful to the athlete to learn. And that's just an unstoppable force. And that's going to continue. Okay. And the, you had a, I would say a diverse career spanning from um, civil engineering to software development. And, and how has this diversity influenced uh, the approach, your approach to either pro pro problem solving or entrepreneurship in general? Well, I think in general, I'm a, I'm sort of a do it yourself or, you know, the engineer in me loves solving problems, uh, solving problems for myself, whether it's solving how I train for an event or, you know, using video to help my own golf swing. Um, engineering is all about solving problems. Um, and that's just led to solving problems with, with computers. And I love the product challenge of it. I love, you know, it's, it's quite rewarding to build something and then have people use it to solve a problem or a need uh, mm -hmm. on their end. That's what drives me. And that's where the engineering background helped. I haven't yeah. been or done civil engineering for 20 years. Um, but all those lessons you learn in how to approach problem solving, um, honestly, math has been super helpful over the years and just the way to break things down, right? Um, engineering has a way of, while it can be very complex mathematical formulas, this, that, and the other, it's also incredibly simple. Hey, we have a big Canyon. We need to get people from one side to another. How do we do it? Do we build a bridge? Should we helicopter people? Should we create a hovercraft? Should we make a road? Like it helps you think through the steps necessary to get people from one side to the other. And you eventually find this balanced approach uh, through sort of an engineering mindset on what's going to be cost efficient, what's going to be useful, what's going to be fast, you know, da, 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 da. And that all applies to software too every day when you're trying to figure out what to build. You're, you're a part-time farmer as well. You're, that's your hobby. How did you start with that? Yeah, well, we moved to a little uh, farm about seven years ago. And as I ended my time with Training Peaks and Peakswear, um, which, you know, was, was, gosh, I'd been there for 20 years. So it was quite a transition for all to all of a sudden have nothing. Right. And we had moved to this farm. Uh, I started raising a couple of steers for, for, for beef. Uh, we got some other animals, horses, we got some, some chickens and ducks. And actually what I, what I found that I loved about, you know, sort of hobby farming, if you will, or gentleman's farm, whatever, is that the problems you face become so unbelievably clear. It's like, hey, my, my cow needs water. There's no debates about how to get it water. You don't have to have a team of eight people decide, should we get it water? Is that good enough for, is, should, should that make it on the roadmap and strategy? And, and let's create alignment with our marketing teams about the water. No. The cow needs water. You just go find the water. You fill up some buckets and you fill up the, the trough. And now that you've solved the problem, the cow has water and life is good. And it's so clear and straightforward that I love the, the simplicity of farming compared to the vagueness of software development, right? Because in yeah. software, you can do anything. It's a matter of figuring out what to do, right? That's yeah. what we've talked about the last hour and figuring out what to do and how to do it, blah, blah, blah. In farming, yeah. hey, look, the cow pen is really dirty, needs to be cleaned. Guess I'll go clean it. And it's just great. <laughs> well, it's very rewarding to go clean the cow pen and stand back and go, ah, after 40 minutes of breaking poop, it's nice and clean. Didn't have to yeah. decide what to do, how to do it, who should get to do it. It just did it. So I love that aspect of the farming stuff. And, and as I 
you know, as we were starting on form, I was like, what am I going to do with my time? Well, I put a lot of that energy into uh, improving our farm and raising some animals and now on forms taken off. So I'm less, uh, I've hired somebody to clean our barn instead of me doing it all the time uh, because I put my energy into on form where it's a little more, more useful or valuable. Uh, but I just love the, the, the sort of hands-on nature of farming um, versus the virtual nature of software. How many, uh, how many hours a day are you working on it? <laughs> My wife would say every hour of the day that I'm not, a, not asleep. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a very much a full-time effort now. Um, I just built this studio here. This is my office on our property. Um, yeah, this looks and nice. And I'm working on it continuously. And, and, and that's part of being a startup. I answer emails all the time. Um, you know, it's actually a, 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 sometimes a difficult balance because I believe to grow a company, you have to give an inordinate amount of your time to those early customers and make sure that they understand they're taken care of because those customers need to tell other customers. So I've dedicated a massive amount of my energy uh, to that. Uh, we're now growing, getting some teams that can cover stuff. So I don't have to do all of that. You know, and, and my role here is basically everything besides the code. Krishna, my, my partner, co-founder, he heads all of our development side. I take care of the marketing support, accounting, cleaning, uh, sweeping, you know, everything else. Um, and, and, and we both collaborate on products. So um, it's a very much a, a full-time effort. And now with hiring, that's a whole nother challenge. And so I'm, I'm starting to be able to get a little bit out of the weeds and rely on people far better at me in, in sales and, and, and doing customer support, et cetera. Uh, but it's still very much a, you know, uh, a, a big time commitment. No, I, I was asking because, you know, you had this story that you built one business, exited, moved to another, then, then had a break and then you came back. So essentially that was a transition from probably having a lot of free time to have close to no free yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> It's tough when you, when I left, you know, I think a lot of founders face this, they sell their company and then all of a sudden one day I wake up and I don't have 300 emails to go through and 10 meetings to sit in. It's like, what do well, I do yeah. with myself? And so, you know, on form has now ramped up to, but it's a tough transition and, and there's a lot of doubt, right? There's a lot of doubt in my own head of like, can I do this again? Do I have the energy to do this again? Mm -hmm. um, let's see, man, am I, do I want to spend hours a day talking to customers again and, you know, going through the bugs and the, it, it, but the, the reality is, or, you know, what I've found is, man, as you, as you have that core team, like my, my partner and, you know, our early, uh, other team members, it's so, uh, rewarding and engaging to build something and see other people get value and love it. That customer delight, that that's what powers me. That's what drives me. And it's incredibly war rewarding to, to, to be on a team that builds something and see other people value it and pay for it, et cetera. So it was, uh, after a while, it was pretty natural, uh, for me to find the energy again and, uh, you know, pour all of my time into this. Okay. So that's your motivation to repeat that success and to build uh, a great team and a great product again, as you did yeah. with the tricks and, and the others later on, of course. It is. Yeah, that is, that is it. It took me a while to understand that, you know, when people say, what's your purpose and things like that. And I just found that what really motivates and drives me is, is building something that other people love. It's, it's very rewarding for me. So. Mm -hmm. And what, I used uh, training picks myself, as I mentioned when before the before the podcast, and I really love that. I, it's, I can't believe that it actually it actually has. Uh, you mentioned twenty years right now, or yeah. or close to twenty, fifteen, right, fifteen years. So no, it's been around twenty three years. We started yeah. it in uh, in nineteen ninety nine. Yeah, it's amazing because this product is still great, you know. And after twenty years, it's very hard for a lot of companies to keep their products good you know uh or not to yeah. let's say lose it to the competitors yeah you're I, it's very true the the technical debt that came along in the 
the certain times that we had to invest like a year's worth of effort with no features, but we had mm -hmm. to re-engineer the product because we knew that for the future, we'd have to re-engineer that product to grow. It's an incredibly hard thing for companies to, to bite that bullet or to, mm -hmm. to do make that effort. But um, yeah, I appreciate your recognition of that because our teams over the years, man, we had to do it in 2005, six, we did it again in 2009. We did it again in 2012. Heck, they just went through a huge effort here over the last year. Just some friends of mine that, that are still there, um, you know, going through a bunch of re-engineering and, and, mm -hmm. and in order to continue to sustain it. So, and I think that's something that's, that that's pretty neat to say. Training Peaks is still a, a privately owned entity. Um, they're, they're doing great. I'm very proud of what my contributions were there and there's nothing better for me than to see it continue to grow and, and do well. So, uh, 20 years, hopefully I can do that again with on form. Yeah. 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 I hope so too, because it sounds, it sounds amazing to be honest, but gear, um, thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today and for sharing the insights on the product development and your story it was very, very inspirational. So I, I hope we'll be able to, you know, record part two sometime soon. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Jan, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Amazing, amazing questions. And I really enjoyed, enjoyed chatting about it. Stay in touch with us, subscribe to our podcast, give us a like, comment or share. If you want to reach out personally, you can find me on LinkedIn and Instagram.